Hello guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to episode five of Chai with Rai. Um, hope you are doing well, hope your day has been great, hope you're having a great, great Thursday. Um, it's been raining here in London, so it's been a bit of a weird weather situation, but um, I'm very excited about today, I'm very excited about our guest who's going to be joining us. Um, I really, really, really created Chai with Rai just out of a pure passion of the people that are around me and the people that I kind of looked up to who have like a wonderful story to share. And I'm kind of really, really nervous about the person who's going to be joining me today because we'll discuss it and we'll get into how I came to find this wonderful person. Um, but yeah, um, guys, every Thursday I do this, Chai with Rai. You can find the previous um, Instagram lives that I've done. You can find the new ones every Thursday, every day, every day, every week, a new guest. But I'm gonna get into this. Okay, so today's guest is Gularana Mir. Um, I'm gonna, I think she's there already, but I have to do this. I have to go through all of your um, wonderful accolades and hopefully I don't get anything wrong. But she is a writer, theatre and practitioner. One half of Thelmas, which is a female-led theatre company. Her debut play, Coconut, which I believe, according to Google, was in April 2018 and was at the Oval House, which was followed by a national tour, which earned her an Offie nomination, which is the Oft West End Theatre Awards. Um, she's in community and new theatre group organisation projects such as Royal, national, uh, Royal Exchange Manchester, Unicorn Theatre, Almedia Projects, DMARTS, Rifle Place Theatres, Peer Product, productions and so much more. She is also one of the panelists, if I'm correct on saying, for the BBC Northern Voices Development Program. Um, her other works include The Bigger Picture and now she is doing some beautiful work which is called Misfits. So I am awaiting for your request now, which I'm going to send to you. All you need to do is and we shall get started. I am going to do this until then. Hopefully you accept it. Hello! Hi. How are you? I'm all right. I'm trying to like balance my phone. So. Oh my god! Have you? Are you? What have you got it up against right now? <laughs> um. So I'm not. I'm not at my house. I'm at um, my writing partner Afshan's house. Okay. So this is where she zooms from. Oh, got it. I'm gonna cut off my filter because my filter always lays. I put a filter on because you know, it just it makes life easier and nicer. <laughs> How are you? How was your day? What have you been up to? Have I gotten anything incorrect in your introduction, by the way? No, I think that was right. I was I like, cut out halfway. Oh, did you? I always find it so weird, like, you know, when you go through people's, like, accolades and things like that. Because uh, some people have, like yourself, such a vast amount of things that you guys have done. Um, but, yeah, talk to me. How was your day? How was your week? And we'll get in this. So it's been um it's a been a a busy week. I'm in Manchester um with uh Afshan and Susie Lodi who I write plays with um and we're currently working on um a treatment for a TV show that we <laughs> just came up with this really crazy idea for and we were like hey let's send it to people that we know so <laughs> we did we sent it to a, a pretty big um exec um and they really liked it so they commissioned us to treatment which basically means that they want up to 10 pages to learn more about the world and the characters and the p potential storylines um so yeah we've been working on that that's a deadline for monday oh and we basically did loads of oh, like, if you can see, oh, hang on see on the wall there yeah there's loads of post-it notes so that's oh basically all of our research um and all of our like plot and character points. Um, so yeah, it's just been tiring. Well, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate this. Can I just say I'm very nervous. <laughs> Why are you nervous? <laughs> well, okay. So I don't know. I think you know the story of like how I came across yourself. I was having, oh my God, I have a feedback. Do you have feedback as well? 
No, but I can put headphones on if you need me to. I say that, I don't know where my headphones are. Wait, let me take my AirPods off and let's see if that is better. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, is it? Okay, I can't hear feedback now, which is better. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so I was having, I think like about a year and a half ago or something like that, I was having a really, really rough day and I love walks along like South Bank Centre and just sort of like walking along there. And I just stopped and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go into the National Theatre and I'm just going to treat myself to like a little meal. So I went into the National Theatre and I was like, I'm being so annoyed right now because I'm working all these hours and things like that and I'm not getting any castings and I want to know where the British Asian scene is because I only knew of a certain amount and I went into the National Theatre bookstore and I was like hey do you guys have any sort of B British Asian theatre writers scripts Yay! anything like that and behold this was there I yeah. read it literally within half an hour screenshotted it tagged you in it and I think that's when we kind of like discussed it but you literally like saved me that was the highlight I was having such a terrible week and day that you literally I read this and I couldn't stop smiling and just I'm obsessed and I have given this play to so many people I kid you not and whenever sometimes I'm set and also if this play ever comes back I want to be Riz just saying <laughs> um so the final version is much better I rewrote it before we went on tour um and I always say to people that if you like the play and you want to read the final version, then let me know. I'll email it out. Um, so happy to share that with you. But uh, do, do you know Tibu, who played Riz? I don't. I have stalked a little bit. I'm oh, my God, I love Tibu. <laughs> I've stalked the people. Um, I yeah. knew that the gentleman who was in there, the, um, the one who played Riz, was also on your writing team, and he helped you, and he kind of gave you perspective, if I'm correct in saying that, because I read that in one of your... Um, interviews that you put on there. Yeah, so uh, I'm just laughing because Afsha joined, so she's somewhere in her house. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, so we did we did two R and Ds really um, on the play, uh, and I like working collaboratively. And Maddie, who directed it and is my Thelma's co partner, um, we work really well together. So we, I had written, I don't know sixty pages. I had a good sense of what the play might involve um and we basically yeah just spent a week in a room talking about the characters talking about the scenarios taking each scene apart thinking about how those actors might play those characters in that scene did a yeah. lot of improvisation and then yeah on the last day we basically just let them improvise the entire play so no scripts yeah we, sh we shouted out what the scenes were um, and then what the emotional beats of the scenes were. So I, I can't remember where that picture's gone now, but there used to be a picture on my Twitter header that was basically the entire play laid out in beats um, okay. and all three actors staring at it. It's a gorgeous shot. It's just like pieces of paper and all, much like the posting. <laughs> um, so yeah, they just improvised the entire show and I recorded it. And the first draft, the first proper draft that was like 90 pages was essentially transcripts of their improvisations tweaked oh, wow. and added around um and then obviously i couldn't that couldn't be the show so i rewrote that but yeah they played a massive part in developing those characters for sure i want to kind of ask a question uh well kind of go through the thing so i want to ask in regards to like your bringing up um and even in one of the things that you mentioned that your mother bought three tickets to the coconut, which I want to know what was her impression of it. Um, and I want to know, like, in regards to your education, how Thelma's came to be. Um, and yeah, all of that. And how you got into writing, if you don't mind me asking that, please. Yeah, sure. So I made sure that my mum saw every version of coconut that existed. It was really important to me that she, I wouldn't say like it, but at least was able to engage with it. Yeah. Um, so she saw it, yeah, every stage when we had a version where Jimmy, not Jimmy, Freudian slip, Simon the character, yeah. um, did something really bad. Like the play ended in a much darker place. And she saw that and she was like, I can see how that would go. Um, so yeah, she really loved it. and. 
she comes to see all my work, so that's great. Uh, and then the other question, what was the other question? It was basically like kind of like how, where you grew up, where you, you know, you have a degree to it with, um, did you go to New York or am I just getting baffled by the way? Because on, um, on the page, which is MMB, it mentions your degree is from within New York. So I was like, did you travel to New York? Did you study in New York? Or it's yeah, just I a did. college program? No, no, I did, um, I did uh, a master's in education and theatre at uh, New York University. Uh, I'm old, so this is back in 2008 when the pound was two to the dollar. Okay. Um, and yeah, I had a choice between going to Central School of Speech and Drama to do applied theatre or going to New York to study educational theatre. Um, and the money would have been the same. So I was like, well... Uh, yeah, and I went to New York instead. Wait, does student finance cover you in New York? No, I worked. I basically have the habit of just uh, working and then blowing all my money on ridiculous things. Oh my gosh. Um, when, <laughs> when I graduated, I blew all my money on a trip uh, to South America. And then I came back and I was working and um, I essentially decided that, you know, I wanted to do something that involved theatre and education and community. And like I said, I could have stayed in London, but I had this little pot of money that was itching and burning a hole <laughs> in my pocket. So I was like, I'm going to New York. How is New York? How was it living It's there? amazing. It's so good. Where did you live? Like, did you live in like Upper Manhattan, Brooklyn, <laughs> Queens? I, I lived in a warehouse in- Oh, the um, dream, the dream. <laughs> I lived in a warehouse in Bushwick before Bushwick was cool. Okay. When people were still getting shot in Bushwick. Okay. Um, so yeah, I lived there and then I was really lucky. Uh, my friend Myers had a housing situation that was... That was... Um, interesting. Interesting. Uh <laughs> And uh, she moved to Boston to live with her boyfriend and was like, would you like to live in my studio? And I was like, yes, because her studio essentially was on the corner of Columbus Circle, right near Trump Towers and Central Park. <laughs> I spent nine months living literally the dream. Um, so I was, our building was next to the Mandarin Oriental. Um, and I remember that one day I could not get into my apartment because President Obama was having dinner at the Mandarin Oriental. <laughs> uh, I was like, guys, I need to get live here. Yeah. Um, so that was really great. And then after that, I think New York can be, my experience in New York can be split into three nine month stints. Um, and then the final part of it, I was working in Harlem. So I ended up bouncing between some apartments up there. But yeah. Um, it, would you mind talking a little bit about Thelma's? Because you are co-owner co and co-founder. Am I incorrect? Sorry. Uh, I'm co-director. Co-director. There's a vast amount of information and things. I kid you not. <laughs> I am so nervous right now. No, no, it's fine. Oh. So uh, Thelma's was started and founded by Maddie Moore, who um, is the artistic director. I'm the executive director. Um, she started it in 2014, um, basically because there's no decent women in theatre or women weren't being invited to be commissioned. Basically, there was just not any decent theatre being made that addressed women's voices, uh, that addressed women's issues um, in a fun way. So she started something called Lady Log, where she commissioned five writers, me being one of them, to just write a 15 minute one, one woman play about something that we were too nervous to write about or had never been permission, given permission to write about, just anything. Um, so I wrote Coconut as a 15 minute one woman show about uh, this character, Rumi, who's preparing to go halal speed dating, um, which is essentially where we meet her in the full length version. But it talks a lot more about kind of her previous dating experiences and uh, stuff that didn't really make it into the full length play. Um, and then the next year that Maddie did it, one of the standout pieces was Lady Killer, which we then ended up obviously turning into full length play and touring, and it's won awards and it was meant to go to New York, but um, 
obviously that didn't happen because of COVID. So that tiny little thing that is meddling with all of our lives right now. Oh, I know, damn it. right? Arr. So basically, yeah, that she started the company and she was just doing this thing and then when when we had a summer, well, we had a year where we talked about doing something with Coconut, but nothing really happened. And then I had a summer where I just applied to loads of jobs and opportunities. Somebody told me, apply to things like you are a mediocre white man. So I was like, oh, got it, right. <laughs> Busted out all this stuff, um, talked myself up, and miraculously, we ended up on a whole bunch of schemes. We were on a Script Accelerator at the park. We got support from the new diorama. And suddenly it looked like Coconut was going to happen. So that's when um, Maddie was like, okay, I think I want to take the company forward. I want to do more with this. And I said to her, great, I'm in, like, whatever you need. And now it's, what, five years later? No, not even five years later. And, yeah, we've got four shows under our belts. And, yeah. <laughs> Where time it's has gone madness. by. It's madness. I don't know how this happened. I have a question which I'll ask later on in regards to okay. coconut. But I I think I've messaged you already, but I'm fascinated that you're British Pakistani and you are so my experience has always been it's I don't because you're of like would you consider yourself a feminist? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I I'm intrigued by by this. I, w I grew up with a single mother who raised me. I think I told you already, she's Pakistani. Like for me, women always have the strength. My, my managers and bosses throughout my entire career have been female led. So though I can see the perception, not the perception, the reality, sorry, let me rephrase myself, of inequality, in my eyes, women are always just... Oh, my mum's here. <laughs> <laughs> have always ended up being the stronger gender. But I want to know how, did, did you ever have to have a conversation with your mother and just be like, look, mom, I'm going into the arts, you know, I don't want to disappoint you, you know, and things like that. Like, I don't want to disappoint the culture, but I'm going to be this, because I've had to have that conversation until this day, I'm ostracized from my family because of that. So I, and especially of women, I, I just want to know, like, is your mom just naturally supportive? Because I'm jealous then a little bit. I'm not envious. I'm just jealous then a little bit. Yeah, totally. I mean, she's here now, so I have to say nice things about her. <laughs> um, and no, I, I, I've said this in all my interviews. I inherit my love of theatre from my parents. Yeah. Um, you know, we went to the West End. We saw shows. Um, they love it. And that's where it came from. I never apologize for anything. And it's a running joke that, like in the house. I just don't apologize for anything. I behave like a, a maniac. I say things that I shouldn't do. I do things that I should do. I just never say sorry. Um, and it, I think it, I was, what, 17? Yeah. When at some point I realized that this was what I was going to do. Um, and they didn't really have a choice. So, you know, <laughs> kudos to them for quietly supporting me. Um, no, I mean, like, they said whatever they wanted to say, but it just, you know, because I went from wanting to be a vet to wanting to be a, uh, a, a human rights lawyer to wanting to, like, study <laughs> European studies to, um, sorry, I'm going to do a creative degree. Uh, and then I graduated from a creative degree and ended up working in Pizza Hut. Like, just, just... Like, nobody wants that for their child. I mean, at least you're bringing in the pesos, you know. I am now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> has the... How would you say has the community been? Like, I've had to fight off stereotypes with, you know, the Asian community all my life. I think, like, being in Bollywood sometimes helps. Like, I work in a Bollywood dance company, so that sometimes helps. But, um, yeah, has... Do you feel like it's kind of hindered you or you kind of get the side eye a little bit? I mean, they can do whatever they want. But my, as I said, my mum's great. She brings the aunties to the show. Like, oh so God. she brought aunties to see Coconut and literally the aunties could not stop touching Jimmy, who played <laughs> Simon. They were like, oh, he's so good. Oh, he's so handsome. Like, they love it. Oh, poor, the poor, what, the Asian guy. Why did he get no love? 
Uh, Tibu. I mean, everybody loves Tibu. But um, yeah, all the aunties came to see everything. They came to see, a few of them came to see Santi and Nas, which was, you know, slightly risque in that we had um, a queer love story. We had two girls kissing on stage. <gasps> um, <laughs> and they saw it and they enjoyed it. And it, the fact is that these people exist and they deserve representation. Yeah. So. Dare I ask a question about Coconut, which is, um, so there was, there's a documentary on Netflix, which is called The First Monday in May, and it's about the Met Gala. And they kind of talk about the fact how the Alexander McQueen show was the prime of when Met Gala became like kind of commercialized and that was like their thing. And after that, it became like the who's who of event. It was no longer just socialites or elitist. It was kind of like the who's who. And there's lots of directors such as like, Sorry, I'm going to mention male ones because they're the only ones coming to my head. I apologize. I apologize. But okay, wait, I'll mention Kristen Wiig too. But there's a lot of people that say there's certain things that will just be their prime. Do you feel like sometimes the conversation can... <laughs> <laughs> there's my mother commenting. <laughs> she means that you go with it. Um, do you think sometimes the conversation, like your peakest work is coconut? And do you ever... <laughs> like no i feel like... the opposite yeah yeah so i feel like because my first love is theater right um i'm really enjoying exploring audio and television but the thing about theater is that mm -hmm. it's it's just so vibrant and visceral and you know the audience is right there and the the relationship that you have with them is so different to what yeah. you do on screen um and theatricality is really exciting to me and that's what I want to focus on. So actually, Coconut, we made a choice not to be... I don't want to say, like, it's really difficult to talk about this without feeling mm. like I'm dumbing it down. We didn't dumb down Coconut, right? But what we did was we presented it in a way that I felt that anyone who had never been to a theatre before, had never seen themselves on the stage before, could come access the story, understand it, understand those characters. Um, and we didn't leave theatricality behind. We had the character of Riz. He's an imaginary person. Like, you know, it for me, it was a perfect blend of accessibility with the fun of theatre. But the stuff that I want to write is slightly more... Risqué? No, not even risqué. Slightly more like... I don't even want to say weird, because that sounds like you're being weird for no point it's just more makes more of dramatic conventions so for example with Santi and Naz we had some movement sections we had uh two timelines um I've written I'm working on a play called boot camp which is an ensemble piece and it has a chorus in it um which follows the same rules as a Greek chorus so yeah I don't think I peaked with coconut at all if anything sometimes I'm embarrassed about it really because, yeah well because it wasn't it wasn't very well received critically and then I reread it and I'm like no nah, man that's banging I am a good writer all of those people sucked you can take your two-star review and shut it um, you got two star yeah I did from the stage that one hurt well, that's an uh, um, unsubscription that's happening to stage because I used to subscribe <laughs> no, don't do to that. you. So, don't do that. And it was written, the, the review was written by a black woman as well. So I felt, <laughs> I felt, I took it personally. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm generally good at not taking reviews personally, but that one hurt. Is it because it, she was yeah. ethnic and you were like, I'm a woman, you're a woman, yeah, we're both ethnic. Like, Come on, dude. Well, yeah, a little bit of that, but also I... I, th I think obviously there was an element of that, but I think more it was the fact that she, the way that she wrote about it, she thought that it was super shallow and uh, one one note and one level. Um, and I guess that must have been a concern about of mine, whether the play was that. And that's why it sort of got under the skin. But with, with everything else, um, I'm like, meh, you don't like it, you don't like it. Yeah. How, because you direct and because you write, how easy is it for you to separate those two kind of like mindsets? Because sometimes there's a lot of writers that I've even worked for and I've even written just like small things, but sometimes it's hard for me to switch my hats. I no longer professionally direct. I did a, a director training course and by the end of it was like, yeah, I don't want to be a director. Oh, really? Yeah. It was that intense? Um, no, that wasn't anything because of the course. Um, 
it was a great course. I did springboard at the Young Vic um, with Bolohan, who's now artistic director of Brixton House. I had a really great week. I met really great people. Um, it was just the directors that came in. So like Sasha Wares came in. Uh, if you don't know her work, it's really good. Um, Richard Twyman from oh Actors Touring Company. Wow. Um, yeah. So just <clears throat> when you're faced with like the people who are at the peak of their careers and doing really well um it was just that internal introspection that i was like i don't want to do this i want to write yeah um i like making work which is why i've started uh identifying as a theater maker um and i really enjoy the collaborative process in a rehearsal room that involves devising or kind of like that weird space between devising and r and d but yeah i have no desire to professionally direct at all when you say professionally does that mean you're on the side you'll just do a couple little situations here and there no i do like i do like little dramaturgy <clears throat> things like I, I i do identify as being a dramaturg so i like taking plays apart and putting them back together in a way that fits with writers um and obviously youth and community work involves an element of directing um but i would rather be the writer What's your first recollection of your <clears throat> you going to the theatre or the West End with your parents and just being like from then point you were like I want to be in this industry and what would be the second question which is what made you go like I'm going to be a writer or a theatre maker and all of these things that you've just said? Do you know what I don't know what this is? People ask me this and I oh, don't because <laughs> I went to see Joseph right? I remember going to see Joseph yeah and loving it. And we had the tape and I knew all the songs and I loved singing along and I loved the spectacle of it. And we went to see the Snow Queen. Never seen I wanna it. say it, Bromley Theatre. I don't know if Mars here and she knows she can type, but like we went to see things, but at no point did I feel sorry, I just realised I'm being really loud. At no point <laughs> at I'm no point was I like I wanna do that. Yeah. Or at no point did I feel like that was an option for me. But I did it anyway. I don't know what that says about me. Um, yeah, I think it was only when I got... I I liked writing and I liked telling stories and I didn't really mind what form that took. And then I went and did my university degree, which had a lot more theatre than I realised it would have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then I was like, all right, I, I guess this is it. And then I graduated wanting to either become a journalist or go into theatre. Um, <clears throat> and it just somehow ended up being in theatre. But even then, it came from that educational aspect. Like, I was interested in how we can use theatre as a tool to work with, like, young people or in community groups. Um, and I didn't think that professional writing was for me until... Like, I did a course, I guess, with David Eldridge at the Queen's Theatre. Six-week course. And I'd written plays before that. But I just, again, like, I didn't feel like anything that I had to say was interesting enough. And I did this course with David. And um, I hated the play that I wrote. But there was something that he said about it that I was like, okay, I think I might be good at this. And then I went to New York and I started writing more. Um... And then I took a playwriting class as part of my master's and that was when everyone was like, you are good at this. And by that time, I'd done... See, the thing was, I hadn't done enough work. Like, mm -hmm. I hadn't engaged with enough people. I hadn't got enough of a concept of theatre. Because I'd watched theatre, I just never... I hadn't done drama. Uh, I hadn't done after-school drama or anything like that. So it wasn't until I started working with, like, kids and doing youth theatre that it kind of came... To me yeah. and then because I could write I started writing plays and then they just spiraled and now we're here. For somebody who I feel like now there's a lot of community projects and there's a lot more exposure in schools in regards to theatre and arts correct me if I'm wrong again I haven't been to a school in like five years or worked on something I feel like now with like programs even just online there's masterclass where you can really do lots of online courses and there's lots of tools out there. But for somebody who, I don't know, watches the telly, 
watches Star Plus, watches anything and is like, you know what, I either want to be an actress, I want to be a writer, I want to do all of this. And especially as a girl and knows that that option is just not realistic. What do you sort of say to that? And what path would you kind of like, because I have lots of friends who say to me who are doctors and lawyers and like are doing part-time acting or part-time course like through City Academy or through other things. And, you know, they're all good programs, but they're just like, oh, I knew the, that it was never a realistic goal for me. And I was just like, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I guess I would ask them to think about what does that mean, right? Um, a hobby is a hobby until it's not a hobby anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm not dissing Star Plus after <laughs> I love Star Plus. Tulsi and QK Sas become people who see. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, a hobby is a hobby until somebody starts paying you for it. Um, you know, and you're not going to get there until you try. I guess the big, the like the biggest thing that I experienced was I didn't have a a network. So when I got back to London in 2011, after having a really strong network in New York and making making work out there and having a theatre company um I got back and I I didn't know anyone um the the if you think if you think about where you make friends or where you meet people it's normally at an educational institute or like if you do an artist an extracurricular activity or something like that and you know as a however old I was when I got back from New York and there wasn't there was no there was no way in yeah. um, that I could see. And it was then again, so then it was about like finding the resources, um, mailing lists, uh, like arts admin is a really great mailing list. I signed up for that. And then you just see things come into your inbox, little opportunities or short play nights. And it goes from just applying to stuff to suddenly getting someone being like, oh, we like this, can we stage it? And you're like, yeah, great. And then you meet all the actors and the other writers and the directors and you make friends and um, you go and see their other stuff and then you go for drinks and then you talk about projects and that's essentially how it works. Um, so that all takes time. And I have never been shy of saying that I've been really privileged that whenever I come <clears throat> back or I exit a situation my parents are willing to have me at home so there's less pressure financial pressure on getting a job that pays the bills um although I've always worked it's the idea of I don't know like you do your job for some people you do your job and then you do your hobby right yeah um for me it was like my job is I want my from the offset as soon as I got back to London to London after New York because I'd been working in theatre in New York I was like I, I will take nothing less than the same as what I was doing out there yeah so um I I got hired by Bigfoot which is an arts educational company teachers in schools and other little sports arts organizations which gave me which maybe didn't earn me a lot of money but it gave me the flexibility of playing with theater and kids in the daytime and at nighttime writing. Um, so essentially I've curated a life that is a day job um, and a love job, I guess. Uh, that is all the same thing, if that makes sense to people. Um, but that takes a lot of, <laughs> a lot of like, strong will and skin like a lot of rejections a lot of not yeah. very nice feedback on work a lot of hard slogs but if you're good it well yeah i was gonna say if you're good it happens that's not true it's it's about timing as well but development opportunities like um so i did tamasha's playwrights which is where i met Asha. um and, you know, that's a training program and a network in itself. Yeah. So things like that. There are schemes out there, um, but you don't, you've got to be in it to win it. So you've got to be in those circles to know about them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say people, for your friends who want to get started or need help, like signing up to Tamasha's uh, Developing Artists Newsletter, Arts Admin, um, Facebook of all places has loads of groups, Playwright yeah. UK, all of that stuff. Like, just insert yourself into places. Do you? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, go That's ahead. Fine. 
I was just babbling. Please, oh. next question. <laughs> Um, no, it's fine. I, I have so much to ask you and I feel like an hour is not enough and we've already done half an hour. Um, you talk about, I want to ask, it's, it's a two-parted question. One is about female representation and one is about ethnic representation. You okay? Is that a fly? Is that a monkey? No. <laughs> um, do you think the entertainment sector as a whole, be it theater, be it film, be it TV, do you think now that there is enough British or just Asian um, representation? Because I know you talked about Mindy Kaling and not, I know you talk about like Aziz Ansari and you talked about some other people as well. And I know in the theater scene, like I have, you know, I read your stuff and I know of like just in the Burma and you know, there's other people like Fiscal, there's so many more companies, but do you think that there is enough a representation now for us not to have these sort of stereotypical roles that your son is born he's going to be a doctor he's going to be an architect like your daughter's born she you know because these things still do exist like I have cousins who like still go on about these sort of situations and then the second question is about female led director producers parts and all of that sort of thing. Because I know you talk about in your independent sort of article about the gap and why Thelma was created and why you, you're doing the work that you're doing. But yeah, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, no is the answer um, <laughs> to all of it. Um, you know, there's, gr there's great, I think there are great artists in this country. And um, what COVID has done is that it's made us aware of each other like I've been in so many zooms um well I was in so many zooms over lockdown where um suddenly it was like oh let's have a South Asian artists session and I'm like what okay <laughs> great yeah someone's talking about us thinking about us great do you so, hate you know, that or love it because sometimes I you're just it. like diversity for the sake of diversity but are you being there for your talent or are you there just to get the tick mark I oh, know. So these are these were like run um, by South Asian artists. So we had okay. um, Anjali at Tara, who was doing uh, tea with Tara on Fridays, and then Dr. Sita Thomas was running Zooms um, with the Young Vic, and basically there were just so many people in in the room um, with you know high flyers like Tanika Gupta. Um, and uh, and Kuli Thiari, who used to work for like Red Ladder, and now I oh, shouldn't have started that because I don't know what she does now. She's cultural, some cultural lead city. Oh my god, I'm getting told off because I don't know. It's what. okay, it's but okay. These are like, um, but these are like you know, the founding women of South Asian theater in the UK, um, and then new artists uh like I, I think i saw natasha kathy chandra um and some other i'm not going to name drop because otherwise i'm going to find myself in knots but like you know young actors who were at drama school right now um, yeah. and that was really inspiring to see so many people in one zoom room but what frustrated me was that people were typing into the chat being like oh where's so and so so like where are the queer asian stories and afshan and i like we wrote a play like come on it's almost like nobody communicates with each other because and i talk about this a lot i think this is a really competitive so nobody wants really? to see what's already wait, there wait, no really yeah so there's no sense of like there's no sense of communication or collaboration right um so i think that's what we need to start doing better because just because um, but also I feel like that will help in terms of representation because then we're like, okay, I know three artists that I can recommend who, after you work with me, you should work with next, right? Because they're telling great South Asian stories, their voices are really important, um, but they're also very different to mine. Um, yes. So it's that case of like passing the baton on, which I think that we don't do enough. Um, and I also, and I, I again, I talk about this a lot. I think there is not enough development for South Asian writers. So a lot of us get stuck in this loop of writing about identity politics. So everyone's first play is about how hard it is to be a brown person. 
which is great. You have to write that play. Like, that's everybody has to do it. But we will never get taken seriously if that's the only work that's getting churned out, right? And that's yeah. just a sad, sad fact of the industry. So that's why, because I have a background in educational theatre and I run classes and workshops and I'm running this masterclass for the um, for the national. Ha! By the way, can we talk about that? Somebody put a brown woman in charge of teaching the next generation of playwrights. Uh, Why didn't you mention this before? I don't know <laughs> I don't... of this. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, and I work a lot with uh, Southwark Playhouse and their schools program. And just the first thing that I say to young kids of colour is, we all have trauma, guys. It's really difficult to be us in the UK right now. But if you want to write about that, I want to help you write it in a way that is theatrical and exciting um, and isn't going to traumatise the audience. It's going to send them home with loads of great stuff to think about. So that's been my goal, A, to do that in my own work, and then B, to try and help um, the next generation of artists to do that. Because, I mean, and it even happens now, like the go-to thing is like, oh, hey, can you come and write a play for us? Um, and can it be about like honor violence? Yeah, because you're a brown woman and like that means you know about honor violence and whoop Yeah, we need another play about a dead woman. Woo! Like no I'm done with it. Like I'm really really done with it um, I want more joy, which I think is why I've been so drawn to like television because people are giving me permission to write rom-coms um, with Yes Right? Please um, do so something written, for Netflix I've written a short film. Um, I can't say who it's for yet, but it's like eight minutes of this gorgeous, gorgeous, um, awkward first date between two brown Muslim teenagers. And uh, we had a Muslim director, Raisa Ahmed, she's amazing, um, and like a predominantly brown team, actually. Sophia was a producer. And it was just like glorious. It's glorious. It's going to on iPlayer and there will be two young teenagers falling in love on your screens um, versus, yeah, like what theatre wants you to write about, which is all of your, all of your sadness. Um, we have just a couple minutes left before I really want to play this game. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to kind of brush up on like women in theatre and how that kind of like came to be and do you sometimes feel typecasted as like which you kind of already talked about already being a South Asian theatre writer or women led like sometimes do you just want to be like yes there's a there's a shortage of certain stories there's a shortage of women in theatre and in the arts in general um, but I also I'm just telling them just take my shit because it's good that's as simple as that yeah I mean there's definitely that and I think that's what the filmers are trying to do. So all of our shows, if you actually dissect them, have really great, well, I say great, really intense social messages. So for example, Lady Killer is about this working class woman who um, who kills a hotel, cha uh, she's a hotel chambermaid and she kills a guest. Yeah. Right? And um, she, it opens with that. So you know that that's I'm what sorry. happens. There's a dead body on stage. <laughs> like murder um, mystery. It's not a murder mystery, it's more like why. And then when you get into it, she talks about, like she's a working class woman and she talks about taxes and how corporations don't pay taxes and abuse of power and how like what men do in hotel rooms and all that stuff. Um, and that's a feminist piece of theater. That is a woman saying, I have been driven to murder because the system is, that's my mother gone, is fucking awful right <laughs> the, the system sorry, hates auntie. sorry auntie the system hates women and the only thing that is left to do is for women to murder like that's how far it goes um and people love it they love it because it's got blood and it's murder and it's horror and like we've had all sorts of people come and see the show which is why it's won awards and sold so many tickets but it's a feminist piece of theater right and you compare that to a show where women stand on stage and talk about their periods. <laughs> the vagina <laughs> Those are great. is that what Those you're talking about? Those are great, right? But the point is that you can talk about those issues that affect all of us in a way that is exciting and engaging and not stereotypical. Um, Auntie's still here, by the way. Just want to let you know that. Oh, God, sorry. Auntie, she um, doesn't apologise, remember? <laughs> uh... 
And then so Santiana's is about partition, but it's not really. It's about two young women and it's about the oppression of like women in uh, that particular province. Um, it's about how they never have any choice. She says, what's your mother? Uh, um, <laughs> how they don't we have any choice. On, it's fine. <laughs> so it's just this idea that you can you can tell stories that address global issues that are feminist led that have women in them without it being that that play that you're forced to go and see because your friend that play in like friends oh where she's like love is a four letter one how yeah. could he leave me that there you go that's what you don't have to do to write a feminist piece of theater got it all right well I could literally, I'm so grateful that you did this, by the way. And I feel like I could chat to you all day if you had the time. And I'm so, so thankful that you have named all these people because I'm going to stalk them now. And I'm going to try and grow <laughs> my network because I've been a baboon and not grown mine. But I also want to play a game and make this a little bit fun. So the game is called Sip a Chai or Play with Rye. So that means... But I drank all my chai. You could get some more chai, please. <laughs> or Parni. <Up> chai. <laughs> or Parni G. Um, so basically, if you don't want to answer, you sip your chai or pani or hava. Um, but if you want to play, you play with rice. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Easy question. Um, and I feel like this is probably something some might have asked you, but you know, bans, bans. Um, you wrote a play <laughs> called Coconut. What is the most coconut thing that you have done? <laughs> When I was younger, I wanted to be Taylor Swift. Oh, okay, okay. By the way, I'm just sorry, hang on. No yep. worries. You named Gwen Stefani as one of your role idols, which I have a question about later. So I'm going to ask you that. All right. Yeah, that you... was until she wore a bindi. Okay. Oh, yes, controversial. <laughs> you have written about the fact that um, you were into grunge music um, when you were growing up. Um, <laughs> well done. Thank you. Um, what is your favorite band and song? It's uh, <laughs> such a it? difficult can, question. Can you sing I'm it? I'm not singing. You have to sing it. That's part of the game. Otherwise, you have to sip something. And there's nothing to sip, so you have to sing your favorite band song. Ready? No, Three. no, I'm not going to sing it. You it's in the middle to. by Jimmy Eat World. It's fine. Come on, just a little. Just a little. I'm not singing. No, just, please. Just a little. No. Ah. There's nothing in this. Come on. Okay. You talk about dating and that coconut is a little bit of like somewhat of a self-reflective pay, would you say? Except for the fact that, you know, you, there's no abuse and things like that. Um, you talk about dating. I want to know what, during that period, did you go on like Muzmatch or anything like that situation? No, I'm laughing with <laughs> I want to know what's the worst date I... and the best date if you did like a Muslim Asian dating. Like there was Dilmel, I've been on that. Um, Muzmaj, I went on there just for shit. Or no, Shadi.com. Did you go on Shadi.com? Uh, only for research purposes. Oh my God, they're so hilarious. <laughs> but In fact, I think I went... No, didn't go. Oh God. Okay, worst date and best date. Go, go, go. Nothing against Muzmaj, by the way. Mother's here. Oh. Come on. Worst just worst day, day and best worst day. Was, the worst day was the dude that made me onions. Okay. <laughs> We're just a sautéed onions. No, just like raw onions. And he was like, oh, you have to eat it with your dal. And I was like, no. What, he thought it was a tarka and then he's putting it on top. Nah, it's like, what was it? Turkish lentil soup. And it comes with the, like, the onion the raw onions he's like oh you have to to make the most of it you have to eat it with the onion i was like mate i don't want to eat raw onion <laughs> like, stop trying to force feed me raw onion i was just saying lol the muzmatch because you tried to get me to make join muzmatch uh when i <laughs> there's nothing wrong with muzmatch. When my husband left she was like oh it's fine just join muzmatch <laughs> Um, I love Muzmatch. I've I've been on there for research purposes as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's the best day? Would it be the Indian guy who you found out you had the same auntie in relation? So my auntie was not my auntie. His auntie was actually my auntie. Yeah. What would be the best day? 
um, a walk by the sea, I think. Just and any lots sea? Of laughing. What sea? Any was sea. It? Anything. Okay. Maybe not the Thames Estuary at South End, though. <laughs> what you got against that? Spells funny. I mean, they all do. It's UK. Um, okay, you have tattoos and piercings. Um, I do. How many do you have all together? Which one hurt the least and which one hurt the most? <laughs> Five p uh, tattoos. Uh... Did you say pitta tattoos? No, tattoos. Oh, I thought you said pitta tattoos. I was like, you got pittas. You got I have pitta tattoos and pittas. Um, which one hurt the most? Uh, the one on my bicep, because I can't show you now. Well, obviously. But part of it goes like quite far, not like into my armpit, but. Wait, what? It felt like it was in my armpit when he was doing it. And I was like, I don't like the way that that feels at all. <laughs> Did you just stop him and he was you were like it's fine, it's finished, it's finished. It's I was done. like it's a Malteser break now. <laughs> you have to take sugar to help with the adrenaline. Um so I was like, stop, we're gonna stop for Maltesers. Okay. Um most okay, you I feel like you'll be maybe will be politically correct. Most overrated piece of theatre in the West End and most underrated piece of theatre. To time. Like till now, cats. <laughs> so overrated. I auditioned for Cats the movie. Can you not do this, okay? Cats. What was that? <laughs> it's Billy. It's called being a Billy. That was overrated. Okay. Um. Isn't that? Andrew I'm Logan? sure there's more stuff Ouch. that I've seen. Oh, we get into so much trouble with this. I know. Okay. Um, underrated. I've forgotten what theatre is, man. It's been so long. Dude, come on. We've got seven minutes left. I have so many questions. <laughs> Underrated. I really enjoyed... I really enjoyed St. George and the Dragon at the National Theatre, right? Okay. People hated it. I thought it was great. It had a massive dragon come down onto the stage. It was brilliant. Loved it. Okay, well, hopefully... Check out the, the Playtex if you can. Hopefully the National will stream it, as they've been streaming. Oh, I'll tell, I'll tell you what was overrated. It was Anthony and Cleopatra. Oh, Just killing the classics and cult classics, aren't you? Next thing you know, you'll be saying Joseph and the Technicolor Dream, cult, which was, like, your beginning. Uh, no, Joseph was amazing. I have never liked Joseph. I'm so sorry. Oh. So sorry. I think it's so overrated. I'm going to have to end this call. It's okay. It's, it's finishing in like six minutes. Um, <laughs> just bear with. What would you rather have? Critical acclaim or sold out shows? Sold out shows. Um, you put a Gumtree ad looking for an Asian Zach Braff <laughs> type. What was the worst pickup or introductory line that you got on your Gumtree ad? <laughs> Uh, an East Asian man who was like, is this the right kind of Asian? And I was like, no. <laughs> uh, what would you rather have? Gender equality or world peace? Oh, dude. Ah! Uh, if you Gender equality because women would never allow wars to happen. I knew you were going to say this. I knew you were going to say this. I was like, if she goes for gender equality, she's going to be like, oh, because women are the strong agenda and she, they would just never blah, blah, blah. Exactly. All right, cool. Dal or bindi? Bindi. Gulab jamun ya jalebi? Jalebi. Yeah! Laddu or barfi? Barfi. Uh, Afshan says world peace comes with gender equality. I feel like uh... gender equality comes with world peace, but okay. We'll, we'll have yours. We'll have yours. Um... Rani or Kajal? Kajal. Well, oh, hesitantly. <laughs> yeah. Shahrukh or Amitabh? <laughs> I can't choose between those two. Yeah, you can. They're both overrated. This is true. Well, let's go with Shahrukh Khan then. Nusrat Fateli Khan or Noor Jahan? Please tell me you listen to Noor Jahan as a kid growing up. If, if you, if auntie, 
if your auntie did not play, if auntie G did not play, in, no, we we're Jaffa. strictly a Nusra Fateh Ali uh, household, I'm afraid. So, wait, you know of Nur Jahan, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'll. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Writer's block or deadline crunch? Uh, deadline crunch. Writer's block only comes because you don't know what you're writing about. Ooh. If you do your plot improperly, you will never be blocked. <laughs> what do you do to get over writer's block? Oh, you kind of just answer that. Um, favorite Gwen Stefani song and sing it. Well, the singing is not happening. Come um, on. Or dance. Just dance. I don't know. Do holla back, girl. No, that one's awful. What was the one? Uh, do... Yeah, there you go. You just No, it'll be, a su it'll be Sunday morning, by no doubt. Oh. Uh, well, she's she's not really she's yeah. But didn't she wear a bindi when she was in No Doubt as well all the time? Yeah, she did. But yeah. I wasn't woke enough to know that that was a problem then. Ah, uh, how could you? Well, that ends it. I had some more controversial questions, but it, we have three minutes, so I'm not going to ask that. Where I rather ask um, your upcoming projects. You're working. You've worked on some stuff. And mention a little bit about Misfits, which you have right now, which you posted on your Instagram. But any upcoming projects? Anything? Anything? Yeah. So um, Misfits um, was commissioned by Queen's Theatre Hornchurch. You can watch it in the venue, or you can watch it on a live stream. Oh. Uh, it's the 12th to the 22nd of November. Um, you can buy tickets from my bio. The link to my bio. <laughs> the bio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's co-written. We just had a read-through today, which is why my brain is totally fried. It's um, four writers from Essex. It's about our own, like mostly, they're quite personal. Um, yeah, just growing up. It's about growing up brown in Essex, which is interesting. Cool. Any um, other upcoming I'm... projects? Any other upcoming? We've got two minutes left. I have two more questions. Come on. Uh, upcoming projects, I can't talk about them, but just keep your eyes peeled on iPlayer. And then, like, when it drops, obviously, I'll let you know. So. It'll be like big man ting, sorry, big woman ting's happening. In it? Yeah. Um, okay, peaks and valleys. I usually do this question on everybody's birthdays. Um, what is a peak of your life that you are you have learned a good lesson for? And what is a valley, which is like, you know, in the down space? And you were like, this lesson was good. I learned this from it. Go! One minute left! Uh, <laughs> a peak, I guess, was... So that's an interesting question. A good thing that I learned a lesson from. Yeah. A good thing that happened to you that you learned. I mean, from. I would say like career success generally, getting getting commissions. Um I yeah, the Royal Exchange's young company was an amazing experience. Uh and I learned a lot of, from those young people. Um I would say a valley is Probably um, coming home to live with my parents <laughs> after after my, after not being married anymore. I think this is the politest well, way of saying that. Did Auntie ever say this classic line to you, which I feel like all Asian parents do? Is my home like a hotel to you? You just come and check in and check out. Huh? Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. Um, Okay, cool. Yeah, well, I wouldn't recommend getting divorced. Girl. Well, no, actually, let me say, if you're not happy, leave. But it's not the greatest point of people's lives. Where can people find you? <laughs> um, on Instagram, on Twitter. Don't follow me on Twitter unless you want really runty feminist Twitter threads. I will actually, um, I haven't followed you on Twitter, so I'm going to do that. I'm all about it. I um, am currently doing a campaign for Sura on British Bake Off. Um, justice for Sura. She served a raw cake, but I feel like she was manipulated into the situation. But I'm going to follow you on Twitter. All right. Okay. Yeah, or here. And if you follow me on here, then you get lots of cute nephew content. So basically, right. my Instagram is me banging on about all the work that I'm doing. And then my nephew. The two greatest thing of life. Well, thank exactly. you so much for joining. Um, I want to do this me. again. I need to do a part two with you. And I want to work with you in a future. So I'm putting this out in the universe. Um, this is not a proposal of any sense. But I will audition for you. And we will work. We will work on something. 
Um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, by the, oh way, by the way, shout out to Upshaw's really great jacket. I don't know if you can see it. It says pigs are We're ending, we're ending, we're ending. Oh, ah! Thank you.